Hi everyone, uh, welcome to lecture 7. Um, today we'll talk about clay, minerals, and soil structures. Um, so uh, this corresponds to the uh, chapter 4 in the textbook. Yeah. Uh, the one that I'm showing you here, the in introduction to geotechnical engineering, which is written by Holt and Kovac and Shi Shihan. Um, and today we'll cover the first part of this chapter. And in lecture eight, we're going to continue, and then we will uh, finish up the this content about the clay minerals and soil structures. Uh, so the outline shows the uh, the sections that we're going to cover. Um, uh, using this lecture seven, we'll talk about the clay minerals and identification of the clay minerals and specific surface area. The origin of clay mineral uh, is actually from the chemical weathering. So uh, you can think of the, uh, the mechanical weathering, which is the physical weathering. So by erosion of the water, um, water flow, or the wind, or the thermal fracture is refers to as the physical weathering. Uh, on the other hand, the chemical weathering is uh, involves the uh, the geochemical reaction between water and rocks. So here the contact of rocks and the water produced clay either at or near the surface of the earth. For example, the CO2 gas can dissolve in water and form carbonic acid, which will become hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions and make water slightly acidic. So it's uh, like, a, um, like soda, right? You have a uh, carbonate water with some acid. And this acid water can react with rock surfaces and tends to dissolve the uh, potassium ion and silicate, silica from the feldspar. And finally, the feldspar is transformed into kaolinite. So the acid water dissolves the, uh, the rock minerals and then it uh, precipitates in somewhere else. Eh? And then this becomes a clay mineral. So uh, this shows the one example of the chemical weathering. And we're going to talk about more in the later slides. Alteration of feldspar into kaolinite is very common in the decomposed granite. The clay minerals are common in the filling materials of joints and faults in the rock mass. So in Korea also the, there are abundant, abundant granite rocks. So that's why we also have a lot of kaolinite. Eh? Um, in kaolinite in Korea, we also call it as um, the koryongto. So you know the koryongto. And koryongto has been used to make the poetry and dishes a lot in, in the past. Still they're using it. Um, so let's look at the uh, basic unit of clays. Um, clay minerals have units. So one of them is tetrahedral sheet, or we call it silica sheet. And it's made of SI, the silica, and oxygen and it's single tetrahedron layer. And the other representative basic unit is called octahedral sheet uh, or gibbsite sheet. And gibbsite sheet has aluminum ions and also it has oxygen and uh, hydroxyl ion. So you have, like, uh, if it's made of aluminum, if it's composed of aluminum ion, then we call it gibbsite. And if it's composed of the magnesium ion, then we call it brookside. So then uh, again, the silica sheet, or we call it tetrahedral sheet, and octahedral sheet, if it contains the um, uh, aluminum, it's gibbsite. And if it contains magnesium, then it's brookside. The hydro cations are mainly magnesium, and this one is uh, mainly aluminum. And these basic sheets are stacked together to form different clay minerals. So the in, uh, depending on the manner of stacking, and it becomes a different clay mineral. Use the pen. So uh, how it forms the clay mineral? So you have oxygen, hydroxyl ion, and the cations, and form like basic units, either tetrahedral and octahedral basic unit. And then semi-basic units, 
uh, one to one semi basic unit is this one. So you have a one tet tetrahedral sheet and a one octahedral sheet, and this is two to one basic semi a uh, semi basic unit. So you have two tetrahedral sheet up and bottom, and in the middle you have oct one octahedral sheet, and then it's stacked in various ways. So th this one to one uh, unit can stack, and it becomes the kaolinite and hollow site. If the uh, 2 to 1 basic units are stacked, then it's magnetite and vermiculite, illite, and chloride. So we're going to talk about these minerals in detail too. First, the, uh, uh, the kaolinite, which is one of the representative and very abundant uh, clay mineral. And the shape has a platy, a platy shape. And you can see that the uh, one to one unit, the semi basic unit, are stacked in a row. And uh, in between, the reason they are stacked is the hydrogen bonding between hydroxy ion and the oxygen ion here. And they are stacked usually above like 70 to 100 layers. And so be it becomes like uh, 50 nanometer to 2 micrometer. So like, uh, the buffer spacing or the each layer has about like less than one nanometer and they become stacked so that their total thickness like range is 0.05 to 2 micrometer and with this is this one like how large it extends uh, this is very large area and so the width becomes uh, 0.3 or ranges 0.3 to 4 micrometer and important thing is the hydrogen bonding so hydrogen bonding is the main bond that uh, glues the layers together and there's no or minimal interlayer swelling when water added, water molecule is added. Uh. So sometimes when the mo water molecules are around it, then it intrudes and uh, it can absorbs on the surface of this book site and uh, you know the base side of the uh, tetrahedral sheet. But that's not the case in the kaolinite. Huh? Um, when you look at the uh, SEM images, the scanning electron microscope images, it looks like this. So you have a stack of the uh, kaolinite layers, and uh, <coughs> each has a each are the kaolinite mineral. So this one layer, or the this is the one thickness mineral, huh? and the thickness is about like one micrometer, huh? and this is with this. That can be uh, several micrometers. <coughs> and halloisite is also another form of the one to one mineral. And the difference is that you have a water layer in between here, a single layer of the water between unit layers. Um, so that's why, that because of this water molecule, the wasa spacing is bigger than the kaolinite. But this water can evaporate and can be dried. We call it dehydrated when the temperature is. Uh, more than 50 degrees Celsius. And once the halloid site is exposed to that uh, drying temperature, it loses into layer la water and then it's irreversible. So it will not go back to the original halloid site condition. And there's no internal swelling either. Huh? And it's tubular shape. And Momolionite. Uh, let's talk about the momolionite. And this is the 2 to 1 mineral. So, in terms of the, uh, the clay structure, you have one uh, tetrahedral sheet and an uh, octahedral sheet and another tetrahedral sheet at the bottom. And this becomes a semi basic unit. And they are stacked all together. And then it becomes the momolionite. So, here um, it's film like shape. And there are extensive isomorphous substitution. We're gonna talk about this one also again for silicon and aluminum by the other cation. So that means that the uh, this silicon can be replaced with maybe calcium or potassium or aluminum or magnesium, right? And this aluminum has right a uh, the three plus right, and this three plus ion can be also replaced with the other cation like calcium, potassium, and magnesium. So then it loses the uh, positive charges 
So overall, it has the uh, charge deficiency. So it will have negative charge overall in, uh, from the perspective of the neutrality, electri uh, electrical neutrality. So uh, isomorphic substitution causes a charge deficiency. So the overall the mineral will have a huge negative charge on the surface area. Mostly ne negative charge in the optical surface. So this ne negative charge attracts the, uh, the water ion because the water is a uh, polar molecule. So then it, the water can intrude between this layer, you know, or we call it interlayer, and it can expand. So the thickness or the buffer spacing between the unit, the semi basic unit, can range 9.6 angstrom to like infinite because you don't know how much water can absorb in there. Right? Um, <coughs> as I said, uh, the <coughs> momorionite has a film-like uh, fabric and interlayer bonding between silicon sheets is by Van der Waals fold and by the cation which balances charge deficiency. So it's very weak bonding. Right. There exists interlayer swelling, which is very important to engineering practice. So it's, it's also called an expensive, expensive clay. And width is about 0.1 to 1 micrometer, and thickness is very small, like 3 nan nanometer. And uh, thickness is about uh, 100 of the width. And bentonite is also smectite clay. Right? A t common name for clays and soft rock that contains significant amounts of momoyonite and other smectite minerals. So, uh, in typically, the bentonite contains like 50% to 70% of the uh, momoyonite clay. Yeah? Bentonite is produced by the chemical alteration of the volcanic ash, and because of its swelling characteristic, because the, uh, the momoyonite is the expensive clay, right? They can they can swell and expand with water. It is used in geotechnical practice as a drilling fluid mud to stabilize the boreholes and slurry trenches to seal boreholes and to reduce the flow rate through the boreholes area. Most important is as drilling mud in which the momoyonite is used to give the fluid viscosity several times of water. When compared, com when compacted clay liners are used in modern landfill construction, natural clays are of often modified with bentonite to reduce their hydraulic conductivity. Um, the other 2 to 1 type mineral is elite and it's also called as mica and has a flaky shape and basic structure is very similar to the mica so it is sometimes referred to as hydrous mica. Elite is the chief constituent in many shale rock. Um, some of the uh, silicon in the tetrahedral sheets are replaced by the aluminum and some of the aluminum in the octahedral sheets are substituted by the magnesium or iron. Those are the origins of the charge deficiency. Charge deficiency is balanced by the potassium ion between layers here. So it has a uh, ionic bonding between the layer. So this is very strong interlayer bonding it forms. Buffer spacing is fixed at uh, 10 angstrom. And uh, uh, instead of the uh, potassium ion, if you have exchangeable cation with dehydrated water, then it's called a boniculite. And octahedral sheet, in this case, is a brookside, so made of magnesium. And it contains the exchangeable cations such as calcium and magnesium and two layers of water within the interlayer. It can be an excellent insulation material after dehydrated because once you once these are dehydrated, it has capacity to absorb the water, and then it's, they're gonna expand. So uh, once it's gonna have, it will have a very small volume. But when you fill it and if there's some moisture around it, then they will absorb the water, and then they can swell and fill in the all the gaps, eh? and becomes uh, it insulates the mass transfer or the heat transfer. Um, another 2 to 1 
to 1 minerals is chloride so you have 2 to 1 basic unit and the semi basic unit and also you have another octahedral sheet brookside and this connects here and stacks to become a clay mineral and because these are stacked with the uh, ion bonding it's very stable and it's significantly less active than the momoyon ion and mixed layers clay different types of clay mineral have similar structures so that the inter stratification of the layers of different clay mineral can be observed in general mixed cl layer clays are composed of inter stratification of expanded water bearing layer and non water bearing layer so momoyonite and slash uh, elite is the most common and chloride slash vermiculite and chloride slash momoyonite are often found so then how these clay minerals are formed so you have parent material which will be the rock and weathering process to form the clay mineral depending on the like, pH or the water availability and how long uh, uh, the reaction time allowed right? and that or those factors will affect the, uh, the result resulting product which will be the different clay mineral so in poorly drained condition uh, water movement is very slow so then this uh, silicate dissolved from the primary minerals and accumulates in the soil in favors to form two to one clay formation so smectite clay and momoyonite are mostly formed in the well drained condition um, it reaches through the profile so the bases reach through profile it becomes more acidic and it favors two to one elite formiculite to one to one kaolinite to gibbsite <coughs> um, so if you learn and if you go to the graduate school then you can learn about this uh, various geochemical reaction process to form the clay mineral and maybe as an example you can see from here that depending on the rock mineral the parenting material and the conditions they're exposed to Right, they are the hydrogen ion and the hydroxyl ions and potassium ions and sodium ions then it becomes different clay minerals smectite, right, kaolinite, carloisite and gibbsite, hematite so one to one minerals are usually whether from acidic or felgic parent material and expanding 2 to 1 minerals are usually whether from basic or mafic parent material so parent material plays the biggest part of the uh, weathering and whether the soil will be expensive or not eh? so then let's say that you have a uh, fine grain soil and you want to know what are the clay minerals in that fine grain soil so there are several ways to identify the clay mineralogy and one is the x-ray diffraction x-ray diffraction uses the um, uh, reflective uh, x-ray or the diffracted x-ray from the buster spacing so um, do you remember the um, like tetrahedral sheet and octahedral sheet and they're stacked to, you know, in different way so that you have different buster spacing right so kaolinite had like uh, 0.729 nanometer and the other one had like 10 ohmstrom or something like that right so here the bus different clay mineral have various buffer spacing for example the buffer spacing of the kaolinite is 0.72 nanometer or 7.2 ohmstrom so here the kaolinite buffer spacing is this number and momoyonite is about one to depending on like, how they are expensive right and how they how much they expand you know it, it can go up to i think it will go up like infinite and vermiculite 1 to 1.5 or more you can and mica is 1.0 right chloride is 1.4 um, <coughs> so then some of them are kind of overlap so then they will show a different behavior depending when they are exposed to a different solution or different temperature 
So uh, for example, here, kaolinite in an untreated condition, in a kind of uh, standard solution, buffer spacing is 0.71 nanometer. And when they are submerged in ethylene glycol, there is no change. Uh, but when they're heated up to over, uh, more than 500 degrees Celsius, 550, then the peak, the crystal destroys so that you don't get any diffraction pattern. Uh, and momorionite, when it's un untreated, so it ranges 1.4 to 1.5. And when they are submerged in ethylene glycol, it kind of increases. And when they're heated, then it decreases to 0.95 oh, nanometer. So using different solutions and using different temperatures, we can identify the, what are the uh, main clay minerals in, in that uh, mixed clay sample. So this shows the example. Here, um, he, this is the standard solution. And GLI stands for the uh, ethylene glycol so as the, the soil is exposed to different uh, solution still the, there are peaks here the peak is about 0.713 nanometer so diffracted x-ray right? and it shows the this means the buffer spacing but when they're heated to 550 degrees Celsius the peak is gone so th that means that this peak is kaolinite and in a higher diffraction pattern angle here 0 0.334, 0 0.356 is the quartz signal and here um, again this fossil spacing about uh, 0.74 nanometer and they're gone at the 550 degrees Celsius so this must be the kaolinite And in the standard solution, smack tight, the, uh, the buffer spacing about right, 1.4, and they are kind of increased when they are exposed to glycol. Then, so this could be the uh, uh, smack tight. And here's the e light when they are heated to 550 degrees Celsius. So, using different technique and different conditions, you can identify the uh, uh, clay mineralogy in that soil and the other way is to looking at the melting temperature and freezing temperature so like ice will have a different melting temperature than the uh, ethylene alcohol right so using the same concept if you have a different mineralogy then you will have different crystal structure so you will have different melting temperature so for example when you increase the temperature the quartz, their crystal structure changes from alpha form to beta form at 573 degree, uh, degrees Celsius with the end endosomic peak. So when they trend, when there's a transition from alpha to beta structure for the quartz, they absorb the heat to uh, change their shape. Right? So here, as the inc temperature increases, there's a negative peak as they Know, absorb the heat. Uh, likewise, so as you increase the temperature, uh, maybe there's no sam sample, and when, when there's no, um, sorry, when there's no um, phase transformation for the endosomic or the exosomic reaction, then it kind of increases with time linearly. But if there's a phase transition, if it melts, then it will absorb the heat, so you have a hump negative peak like this if it's uh, precipitate then it will emit the heat so exosomic reaction so that you will have a positive peaks so depending on the temperature reaction then uh, you can identify the uh, where the peak is uh, manifesting like kind of uh, appears then it will give you the idea that what are the uh, clay minerals that you have right? And the other method, one of them is the, by looking at the, uh, the fabric or the shape of the mineral. So maybe a, a kaolinite is a platy shape and momorionite is 
a film like J, a light like a flaky. Okay. So using the uh, the microscope, you can identify the clay mineral, or you can use the Casagrande's plasticity chart. So you do the uh, liquid limit and the plastic limit test, and then looking at the uh, where they belong to, then uh, you can identify, kind of get the uh, uh, rough idea the, about the main mineralogy of the your clay. Um, and along with that, with this plasticity chart, people use the activity. And here the activity means the clay activity. And clay activity is defined as the PI, plasticity index, divided by the clay fraction. So A. Yeah? And PI is what? LL minus PL. Right? So liquid limit minus plastic limit. And clay fraction is the clay the percent of the soil less than two micrometer by mass. So uh, when you do the sieve analysis or and uh, you're gonna have you're gonna do the uh, segmentation test. Right? You're gonna have to then you you can find out there how many fractions are have the diameter less than uh, two micrometer, and you you're gonna use that one. Right? And for normal clay. The A activity ranges from 0.75 to 1.25. And for the active clay, it's going to be more than that. And inactive clay, it's going to be less than 0.75. Right? And depending on the activity, so you can identify the main mineralogy of your clay. If the activity is more than 4, then surely you will have momoyonite clay. Um, and the other method is the specific surface area and the cation exchange capacity. Uh, firstly, we'll talk about the uh, specific surface area first. Eh? So specific surface area is the area of your clay mineral divided by the unit mass. So here, kaolinite has 10 to 20 cubic meter per gram of kaolinite. And momoyonite is, it has huge area, like 700 to 800 cubic uh, square meter per gram. And illite is in between that. Right? So depending, and there's a way to you can uh, measure the species of this area of clay mineral. Um, then from this value, you can identify the main clay mineralogy. Um, the cation exchange capacity is the capacity or the ability of your clay mineral to absorb the cation on your surface. So remember that the charge deficiency by the isomorphic uh, replacement. So by uh, because the silicon which has a 4 plus is replaced by the aluminum then you get the 1 uh, one plus or the one minus charge deficiency, right? So then it can absorb and it can uh, yeah, it can tie one positive ion. So then it's one. Huh? So then MEQ is the milli equivalent, you call it, and milli one milli equivalent is equivalent to um, Six times ten to the twenty charges of the electron. So a uh, higher number means that it can absorb more cations right? because of their uh, charge deficiency. The less number means that they are uh, they are not that uh, negative charges. Okay. Uh, the last topic of this lecture is specific surface area or SS. The definition of the specific surface area is surface area divided by the volume. Or, so this is the um, uh, volumetric definition, the first one. And there's also gravimetric definition. If you compute the surface area, the total surface area divided by the total mass, then it's called the gravimetric specific surface area. And this is uh, more preferred uh, in the geotechnical engineering. So the unit of this specific surface area will be square meter per gram or square meter per kilogram 
surface of data. So the area divided by the mass. Eh? And surface, and this indicates the uh, relative contribution by the surface related force to the gravitational force. Eh? So the gram here the, in the uh, denominator means that it's related to the gravitation, eh? the weight. And the uh, uh, numerator here is related to the uh, some kind of surface related force. It could be a surface tension or, or it could be a um, electrostatic force eh? or here. The van der Waals force and Coulombian force and capillary force. Eh? So uh, let's look at one example. How do we compute the spatial surface area or spatial surface? Eh? Let's say that we have a, a cube with a one centimeter long side and the density is the same with gs of typical soil 2.75 gram per cubic meter and then what's the uh, total surface area so you have six faces right and the one face has one cube one square centimeter so one times one centimeter square times six because we have a six one one two three four five six right and the other one on the other hand eh? and what's the um, the total mass let's get the mass here then total volume is one cubic meter and if you multiply the density then it becomes the mass right? so 6 divided by 2.65 then you get you know this will cancel then 2.3 times 10 to the negative 4 square meter per gram. That's the space surface area of this 1 centimeter size cube. What about 1 micrometer size cube? So now its length is how much is it? 1 to 1000, right? So then 6 times one square micrometer and one cubic micrometer times 2.65 gram per cubic centimeter and then the the final the value for this one micrometer cube will be 2.3 square meter per gram here oh i'm sorry so this was wrong so uh one two hundred eh? Right. Oh, so the four hundred. No, it's thousand and ten thousand. So here, how much? It's now ten to the four times bigger. Right. So as the the size gets smaller, then space surface area increases so it's inverse inversely proportional to its size so as the particle size becomes smaller and smaller then the space surface will get bigger and bigger right so if you think about the gravel and sand sand will have the bigger the greater space surface area so if you compare the sand and clay then clay will surely have the bigger space surface area so that's very important lesson here um, so space surface area is inversely proportional to the particle size yeah? um, let's look at the typical value here um, so memorial night has the space surface area of about 700 square meter per gram and this is kind of it will vary largely vary depending on whether you con consider the interfacial area, interlayer surface here. So only if you count the external surface, then it ranges from 50 to 120 square meter. But if you include the interlayer surface, then it becomes like very large. Eh? And for the e light, it's about 65 to 100 square meter per gram. And the carry knife is the smallest, no? 10 to 20 square meter per gram. 
So the main reason is the size. Um, among the clay mineral, the kaolinite has the, uh, the biggest particle size, and monmolonite has the smallest particle size. So that's why the monmolonite has the biggest spectral surface area, and the kaolinite has the smallest spectral surface area. And because the surface area is small, then the capacity to absorb and exchange the cation is also small. So here it's 10 to 20 and it's only like 2 to 15. But here the monoid has like 700, so that's why they, it can also exchange a lot of cations. Mm. When you think about the absorbed water layer, uh, relative size of the absorbed water layer on the sodium monoid and the sodium kaolinite here and for the if we assume the space surface area for the moment is 800 square meter per gram and 10 to 20 then this is 40 to 80 times larger so then the thickness is about like here like 0.1 nanometer uh, 0.1 micrometer and the upper water layer will be about this and uh, for the moment night because it's very very thin about like one nanometer the water layer will be much thicker than the uh, its real thickness. So this hashed area is refers to indicates the water thickness, and you can kind of compare the relative thickness between the clay and the water layer on around it. Okay, thank you. That will be the end of the lecture seven.